Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think it's just fantastic you all came. When they said that it was booked out, I thought there might still be some empty seats, but you really stuck with it. Good on you. Um, my name is Stephen Armstrong, and I'm the creative director of Asia Topa, Asia Pacific Triennial of Performing Arts, a festival celebrating Australians, Australia's contemporary relationship with Asia. May I first and respectfully acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation, pay my respects to their elders past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be with us today, and to acknowledge that the sovereignty of this land has never been ceded. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce today's panellists, um, Nabokov Nabokov Iso. Uh, Nabokov is a translator, interpreter, writer, project manager, and international correspondent. In 2015, she co-founded Art Translators Collective, an independent organisation that explores the value and possibilities of translation in the field of art. Nabokov is resident in Tokyo and is in Melbourne as a guest of Asia Topa. Um, Kylie Bracknell is an Australian actor, writer, TV presenter and theatre director from the southwest of Western Australia, the Noongar Nation. Isabel Lee. Isabel grew up in China, has worked in Singapore and migrated to Australia in 1999. Her short stories have appeared in various literary journals and anthologies, including The Best Australian Short Stories and Southerly. Her first collection of short stories, A Chinese Affair, was published in 2016 by Margaret River Press. Okay, let's go. Um, just as, as a wee introduction. In her absolutely marvellous quarterly essay, which I have in the green room, but it's a, um, by Linda Javen. It's called Found in Translation. If you have an interest in this subject, go and buy it. It's terrific. Um, Linda makes the really simple point that it was not considered remarkable that Christopher Columbus annotated his copy of Pliny in early Italian, labelled his New World discoveries in Portuguese, wrote letters in Castilian, and kept a journal in Latin. But of course, he had a private copy in Greek. <laughs> now, sure, this man was sailing around the world with renewable energy. There was no diesel. <laughs> and he didn't have Facebook. So he had some time on his hands. But I think there's still something to be reflected on there um, about just how cosmopolitan um, uh, he was in, in the 15th century. In 1968, almost half of all Year 12 Australian students studied a second language. And I dare say that these figures did not include Indigenous language speakers. Today, it is just 12%. And of course, that figure is confused by the high number of Australians who already speak a first language other than English. In 2011, half of all Victorians were born overseas or have a parent who was born overseas and one in four speaks a language other than English in their own home. In central Melbourne, this figure is one in two, with Mandarin being the most commonly spoken, and the fastest growing language in Australia is Punjabi. While we're undoubtedly pluralistic, are we truly cosmopolitan? And what about the imperative of translation as an act of cultural preservation, and in fact, living culture? If we take world literature as our example, while 50% of all books available in translation have been translated from English, only 6% are translated into English. This is a cultural trade imbalance with serious implications. Try this at home. Scan your shelves and try and find a single social, economic, or political history of work about an Asia Pacific nation which has been translated into English. Everything that we read about the region that we live in has been written by Anglo people like me. Also, try looking on your shelves for a work of fiction that's been translated from an indigenous language. So while it's true that some publishers in Australia are making great inroads and text can boast 13% of their fiction titles uh, being in translation, including the remarkable Ika Kernawan and Chinese authors Lan Lian Qi, Yu Hua, and Lia Yi Wu. Random House have won major awards for their translations of Murakami and Ishmael Kaderi, and they count Ferente and Yoko Ogawa among their authors. 
and the translations of small presses like Giramondo and Scribe shouldn't be forgotten. But even now, it still feels like literary translation is something of an afterthought, that we are at the very beginning of something, and it's quite fresh and quite exciting and quite unexplored. My first question is really simple. What drives your choices? What drives you to be a translator? And how do you make choices about what you translate? Yes, please. Um, I just want to say thank you to Stephen and, of course, the Wheeler Center for giving me this opportunity. I feel so blessed to be, you know, part of this panel. Um, my the reason that I'm a translator interpreter comes from a very personal um, reason. Um, I was born in Japan, but as you can tell by my American accent, I was uh, I grew up in the United States, and. Um, I grew up in the United States from age five to 10. And when I went back to Japan, I had a huge culture shock. And from that moment, I kind of struggled to um, keep the balance between both of the cultures because the, the American culture was um, an essential aspect of myself. But I really struggled to keep both of them. And that's probably why I decided to be a translator interpreter because I could um, inhabit this in-between space of these two cultures through my work. Um, and yeah, that's why I'm a translator and interpreter. Thank you. Kylie? Kaya Yarn, and Jervin Nyanineja, Kulan Budrak. Yes, well, it's interesting. I didn't set out to become a translator. Um, I still really don't consider myself to be a translator as such. Uh, I get a bit scared of those English titles and words, mm. but um, how I how I came to to do the translating I've done so far is that I've been involved with a the theatre company for 20 years. I started there when I was uh, I just was 16, turning 17, and I learnt a lot of language in that time. And a recent project, um, which you guys may have heard of, around translating the Shakespeare sonnets into Nyungar language simply had to be exquisite and I didn't want to, it was actually offered to other people to translate first and they weren't able to do it. So I put my hand up and I said, okay, I'm ready for this huge challenge. Um, it's scaring me, but I'm ready for it because I've been learning language for a long time and my elders, uh, the senior people in my community have entrusted me with language. They've passed it down to me to hold the baton. And so I thought, this is an opportunity that is staring me in the face and uh, I need to take responsibility and sort of dive in and do the absolute best job I can. So I, in actual fact, didn't choose the work, but I chose to take advantage of the opportunity and do the best job that the I could. The work chose you. Um, do you also translate from uh, between Indigenous languages? No, I don't. The, the thing that a lot of Australians um, aren't aware of at the moment is that there are over 400 different language groups and uh, there are a lot of dialects within that. So I come from the southwest of Western Australia, the Noongar Nation. Um, I'm very lucky to speak my language from that area because a lot of languages are sleeping in this country. I don't translate between languages at the moment, but it's something I would really love to do. I want to learn um, uh, another Indigenous language from this country soon. So hopefully, soon, Great. come back and have a yarn about it then. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Kylie. Isabel? Hi, good evening. Uh, I just want to say I'm so thrilled to be on this panel. Um, in terms of uh, reasons for translation, uh, I think I share uh, with my panelists, it's a very personal drive. Um, I grew up in China and uh, I, I'm predominantly a writer. And living in Australia, uh, English is my working language. So I have this uh, deep fear and anxiety for losing my Chinese, which is such a core part of my being. Um, and uh, with that fear, I started doing uh, translation. It's almost a, 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 a form of uh, self-preservation. And of course, I love poetry, but I'm not a poet. But I, I find translation is an immersion experience. So when you translate poetry, you become a poet. And that gives me immense uh, satisfaction. You talk about English being your stepmother tongue. Can you tell us what you mean by that? You can say, uh, um, in Chinese, um, your native language is called Mu Yu, is mother tongue. Uh, it's associated with maternity, and uh, um, I uh, I love my mother, and to, to the, today she's uh, uh, the embodiment of love um, and kindness in my life. 
And uh, I, I think for English, it's a slightly different relationship with Chinese. I'm always feeling at home with English. It's, it requires effort because I feel the relationship is probably more like a, a relationship with a stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> Not a wicked one, I hope. <laughs> Um, perhaps we could just deal with a really, uh, like a really classic and really obvious question, which is around the idea of approximation. Um, translation cannot be faithful to words or syntax uh, because these are very peculiar and very particular to language and culture. Therefore, the question is, is translation definitely or always a new work or is it an approximation? Um, you know, the, the thing that I'm always interested in um, is... Um, how much people understand the nature of translation. I believe that translation is almost an, an impossible act. Um, a good metaphor that I have is it's like um, you have this house that's made of cotton and you're given this, you know, twigs mm -hmm. to make the exact same house in the same proportion with the same windows. <laughs> And that is very difficult because you have, you're working with a complete different material, yet you have to make it exactly the same. And you know, people think that translation is literally, you know, you translate A to B, and it's it's actually a really messy process. And I really think that you know, it's an interpretation. So if I inter um, translate, say A, um, it's going to go through me, my personal experiences, you know. Uh, my my language levels and it's going to turn into B, but that's actually an interpretation. So um, I th I think the, the the interesting part about translation is that it's it's an impossible act and it, it's one interpretation. There's certainly um, one guideline that you could use would be do you have to pay for it? And yes, you do. Mm -hmm. So if you are a, um, a theatre producer and you want to put on a, a text. Uh, and have it translated into English, there's a royalty on the translation as well as on the original text. And therefore, it must, to a degree, be seen as a new work. Uh, and in fact, if you're Simon Stone, um, the, the theatre director who d ad adapted The Wild Duck, um, I think Ibsen even kind of struggled to be acknowledged um, in the credits of, of his um, adaptation. But that was an adaptation, clearly, rather than a translation as such. Um, Kylie, what's your response to that? My response, hello, in the moment, uh, I was having dinner with some friends last night and I was telling them about coming down to Melbourne from Sydney to have a yarn with you guys. And uh, my friend Rachel said, oh, there's a quote that I heard from uh, Montaigne, French philosopher, I believe, something like, I'm going to do it how she did it. I'm not, gonna, I'm not being rude, but she was talking. She doesn't speak French, but with a French accent. Uh, translation is... Uh, like a woman, if it is beautiful, it is unfaithful. <laughs> if it is beautiful, uh, sorry, if it is unfaithful, it is not beautiful. So, uh, just for a bit of a laugh. But I think that it really resonated with me because in my very um, short journey of translating at the moment, I needed to really make sure that the integrity... Uh, the beauty, the fluidity, and the honour of our language and, and the way we use it, the way it's phrased, remained uh, structured like the house that Noboku is uh, talking about. But at the same time, you don't want to discredit or, or be unfaithful <laughs> to the original writing. So, yes, it is very difficult because you want to honour both and you want to find that parallel, you want to find that space where you can honour both and, and do a great job um, and try not to freak out about it. But, uh, but that's, that's how I feel about it. It is, I agree, it's, it's not an easy task. It's um, a, huge, a huge thing to undertake and I, and I relate to your emotions around that. I'm calling it a stepmother, that's classic. Um, so, so definitely there's a weight of responsibility, um, but it seems like we're pretty brave and love I a challenge. So, but also for me, and to be completely honest, it's about um, finding those artistic avenues, now I'm completely inspired by this, to keep our endangered language alive. And not only alive in, on exhibit, but alive in being spoken in my community. So I also am driven by inspiring people my age and younger to do what I do. Great. Yeah. Isabel? Uh, I'll respond to the question as well. Um, I... I often blame uh, Sophie Coppola, 
uh, for the film Lost in Translation. Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, um, the title of the film combined with uh, uh, certain quotes um, like uh, translation is the um, art of, uh, um, was it, what was it, art of uh, failure or, or something along that line. Um, I actually think um, translation is the art of possibility. Mm. Um, I think uh, I'm very pri pri privileged to uh, know two languages and I have to say, um, at first I was really amazed by the differences between the languages and I focus more on the idiosyncrasies. Um, but over time I start to see how similar they are. It's um, uh, there's inherent nature of language that cut across all languages. I'll give you an example. For example, in English, you have the word tenderness. Tenderness, it means, um, it, it could be tender means pain, but tenderness also means love and, and that feeling, the aching feeling towards someone younger or someone's in, um, in, in, in pain. And in Chinese, the same word teng also means pain and also means tenderness towards mm, someone. Mm. That remarkable similarities between languages. Um, so uh, I, I, I think it is difficult. It is difficult, but it is not impossible. And it's certainly not meant to be easy. Because think about the authors who have put so much pressure on the language. Why should translation of it be easy? Um, exactly. Uh, and the, uh, the intentions of the author, of course, are uppermost in the mind of the translator, I presume. Um, but at the same time, if you think about who your readership is, that could influence the way that you approach the task. And uh, Nabokov, you, you mentioned that there is a genre of work, uh, of translation in Japan, where in fact the readers do not want poetic uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm at all, they want something absolutely dry, a, a more of a literal reading. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Um, so I just want to um, first talk about my standpoint in terms of translation, yeah. because I think um, Isabel and Kylie, Kylie yeah. come from uh, their perspective of translation is much more creative. And um, I think my, for me, it's translation has, is more of a practical thing. And, and the creativity of translation is what I'm hoping to pursue um, with my collective. So one of the biggest questions that we often talk about, um, I talk about this with my colleagues a lot, but when you translate something, um, how much room do you have for interpretation? So do you do a direct translation or do you um, substitute certain words, for example, that would be the cultural equivalent mm. of the language that you're interpreting into? Um, and so that is, that's, um, I'm still a young translator. I'm still, in, you know, I'm just, I just started my career. So the, the question that I always have when I'm translating is how, you know, um, how much do I have to maintain the fidelity of the original text? And there's, I thought this was very interesting because there is a genre in Japan, I don't know if it's something equivalent in Australia, but called um, translation literature. And translation literature is done in a very direct, uh, is a very direct translation, which means that when you're reading this in Japanese, it feels very awkward and hard, difficult to read. Yet the readers love this type of translation because they feel they're accessing the original text. Um, yeah. So they're not reading for pleasure, clearly. They are reading for pleasure, though. <laughs> right. Yeah. But Curious. they just like that challenge of, uh, you know, reading, just mm. that feeling of just accessing the original text. The, the other side of that is that there is a school of thought that says that you shouldn't be inserting the cultural specificity of the reader, of the yeah. reader's language, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it makes an assumption about the authority that that culture has within the original culture. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then it, it really depends what... Exactly, what you're translating for. What you're translating for, And who yeah. your, your audience is, um, which I think gets overlooked a lot. Like, who's reading the translation? Who is it for? Is it people that know, have no idea about the culture? Or is it people that have a certain amount of knowledge about the culture? And that kind of dictates what kind of translation you want to do. Or, in fact, are you reading the work in order to find something out yeah. about the culture? Yeah. Like, to explore it. Who are yeah. your readers or your, your audience... Um, Carly, how do you feel about my your... audience? Yeah, who's my audience? Yeah, these guys. <laughs> um, Beautiful. 
I'm going to stick to thinking about the, specifically the project and, yeah, and sure. rather than me thinking of myself as a translator. Uh, the audience is anyone who wants to listen to a language from our country. Uh, the audience is or are Nyunga community that are keen to uh, follow up on their, their drive and want to know their language better. Um, the audience is anyone who wants to know a piece of history about the country they live in. The audience is also um, people that love the original text and want to see if we did a great job or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and whether they can relate to it through the performance. So. And presumably all of the other elements of Indigenous culture which, um, which make the language as rich as it is um, and which reflect back uh, other aspects of um, culture and art. Absolutely. And it's only the beginning, so... Yeah. Um, Isabel, do you think about your audience? Yeah, um, I think uh, as a translator, um, certainly need to have a, a very good command of the uh, the language. So uh, translation, there's the source language and the target language, so the original and uh, what is translated into. So as a translator, you need to have good command of uh, both languages, but also have a really good understanding of the literary tradition and culture milieu of the of the source language and the source environment. Um, I always think that uh, translation, the mode of translation, I liken it to the mode of storytelling. So the truth of the story is in its telling. So it's not only about translating what's said, but about how it's told uh, from paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, mm. even word by word, really to the anatomical detail of the original. Right. Um, Cervantes said that it was like the back end of a tapestry. Is it as messy for you? That what you've just described sounds really precise and beautiful and pristine on one side and quite chaotic on the other. Well, uh, I liken the role of the translator to the wedding dressmaker. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's um, not exactly tapestry, but similar. So um, it's also the art of invisibility. So you don't want to stand between the work and the reader. So when you see the bride walking down the aisle, and um, the last thing you want is for yourself to be noticed. Okay. So like what you said, all the work is um, hidden. Okay. Do, you, do you feel the same way about it being a messy process? Me? Yeah. Yes. Um, Especially as a young translator, um, I'm still working on my skills. So I'm constantly questioning my translation. And I'm constantly trying to look for, you know, the best option to translate something. So to, it's a very emotionally taxing and um, exhausting process. Is, but, there, is there a difference, Kylie, between uh, translating for prose and translating for song, for instance? Uh, well, my husband's the song man, um, so I get insight from him from time to time, but definitely translating, yeah, for text to song would be different. I guess it would depend on the original text, um, how many syllables per line, for example, what the beat is. Um, perhaps I can give you guys an example. Why not? So... We were asked if we wanted to do a reading today of some translation work that we've done. So I'm going to share something with you guys. And I hope that none of you fall asleep. So the text was originally written by uh, Bob Thiel and George David Wace. And I'm not going to read the English, I'm just going to read the translation that uh, my husband and I did. Jinang Jilba born, where Kopich jet, Bao Bilurin, Nalakanyin, Bangan Ken Karajin, Kopich Kop Pudra, Jinang Wuyan Wool, Jarak Ma, Kop Kerla, Nang Mornin Ba, Nan Ken Karajin, Kopich Kop Pudra, Wool Nyin Walken, Kopich Birluin. Bulamir Nichin Murnin Alecha Kulin. Nunurang Marak Bam Wanking Nach Kulinye. 
Balap kani wangin, ngalak marangin. Ni, no bridge walling. Malachin jinang. Duang karajinabin, ngai chuinyan, manjang. Ngan kain karajin, kopich kop bujura. Kaya, kain karajin, kopich kop bujura. Everyone still awake? <laughs> All right, if you are asleep, I'm going to wake you up. Hopefully, I can sing in tune. So, thank you for listening to that reading. I'm now going to sing the same piece, um, and we'll just see how it resonates or if it's recognisable. No pressure, Kylie. Find my key. Jinang Jilba Born, work up each jet, bow brillowing. Ngala kenyin, bangan kin karijin, kwapich kwapujara. Isn't it gorgeous? Don't stop, don't stop. Jinang wu yan wu, jarak ma, kwap kerala, ngang gurning ba, ngang kin karijin. Join in if you like. Kwapich kwapujara. Wulnyin walkin, kwapich birlowin, bula mirnich ngurnin, ali cha kurlin, nun arang marak bam, wangin nach kurlin ye, bala karni wangin, ngalak marangin, ninu bridge walin, malachin jinang. Dwang karajinabin ngaj winyan manjang bangan king karajin kwa bitch kwa bujura oh kaya king karajin kwa bitch kwa bujura ah Thank you. What an absolute treat, Kylie. Got my brother boy Fred Geisha here in the audience, so he will pick me up on my <laughs> on my pitch and tone later, I'm sure. But um, where were we? Yes, uh, difference from text to song. I, I suppose it's evident because if it's something like that that you can relate to and you know what it is, hopefully you start to smile, and then instead of just using your your nyundiak nyundiak karijan na duangkanya nyanyuang instead of using your brain to just listen to what I might be saying, the song gives you a feeling, an emotion, a connection on that level where you get outside of your your brain and you connect on that level. So um, that's why I'm so proud that a lot of our language throughout history has been through song, um, mostly through song. Even it's even been recorded in writing that's been passed on mostly through song. Then. Um, than speaking, and I'm sure that's similar for, for for these ladies' culture as well in terms of text and song. From the Iliad and Segway. <laughs> Can you just just uh, something that that um, occurs to me is I didn't hear any English words, or at least I didn't hear the approximation of an English word. Were there any words in that song that you found difficult to translate, or did you? World. Oh. What a wonderful world! Don't really have a word for world. Um, yes, so it became, uh, it's, uh, instead of what a wonderful world, it's what a wonderful landmass. <laughs> <laughs> and is that... Well, where do you choose? The sky? Yeah. <laughs> Spirit? But is, the is that because the world <laughs> presumes... Um, Can I just say, yeah, keep please. that question in your head. Can I just say that we translated this within 20 minutes at the request of someone from our community saying, hey, can you fellas translate that song for me so I can sing it when I'm on stage? So that was a first draft, and it's the first time it's ever been performed publicly. So well, if we're your judges... What was your, you know, <laughs> what was your question, Stephen? Um, just whether, um, whether world as a, as a concept has no uh, bearing in uh, Noongar culture because it presumes something finite as opposed to something infinite and kind of circular and complete and whole, which is how I understand. Uh, you, you said it. I right. mean, there's not much to elaborate on there. Definitely, that's how we think. And, and 
common sense, you know, the world is, is it your world? Is it a world that you're thinking of for somebody else or a world that is not yet existing mm. that you want to create or is it, you know, that kind of when you ascend somewhere else? So it definitely makes the task as a translator um, interesting. Not impossible, not difficult or anything like that. It's, it's the choice of how you wish to express it mm. within your thoughts and your emotion, I think. Um, but definitely fine. There's many, many worlds I could have taken that. I tend to, to be honest, I tend to keep this more sacred stuff in the sacred spaces mm. when it's used for more ceremony. And I try to really keep it as literal as I can, but as, you know, take a bit of the beauty into that too. I don't want to just give a flat translation, so to speak. So. But it's a very powerful tool. It, um, and as it is for you too, um, Isabel, your, your, the, the, transla the act of translation as a form of kind of cultural reckoning, if you like. Yeah, I just want to add to um, when Kylie talked about mm. um, the culture and inheritance through songs. You know, the first um, um, collection of poetry in Chinese history is called Book of Songs. So that's um, uh, people used to, scholars used to go out and uh, to reach out to the people to collect songs from them. It's called collect, <coughs> Taifeng, Collecting Wind. Ah. Mm, nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. How, how um, your investigations into translation or the time that you dedicate to it, the, the vocational drive to do it, is also... Uh, in response to the fear of losing language. Yes, um, uh, I prepared a, a reading actually. Please. Um, uh, in Kelsa, please. Along this line. So this is uh, from my collection and it's from a story uh, called Narrative of Grief. We were talking about grief in the green room. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the character has lost her language at uh, an early age and uh, um, that trauma uh, leaves her with that uh, sense of uh, profound melancholy. So I'll just um, I'll read a, a short passage. My parents came to London when I was five, leaving me with my grandparents in China. After they finished their studies and found jobs, they brought me over. By then, I was 10. Because my English was inadequate, I had to go down one grade. My mother decided that we should speak only English at home to help me practice. That was how she and my father had learned in their early days. When they were just my father and me, he would speak Chinese to me but I was too proud to accept his kindness. <laughs> Only when talking to my grandmother on the phone did I speak Chinese, and I would be choked with tears after the first two words, nai nai. I held back my tears, knowing the flat above the day and night pharmacy in Croydon was to be my home, new home. This deliberate effort was made in English, and a single Chinese word would have spoiled it. I developed a curious condition which my mother called numbness and attributed to my over-concentration on studying. I became oblivious to the taste of food and often forgot to put any sauce on my spaghetti. Sometimes my parents would come home to find that I had forgotten to turn on the heater and was icy cold. When grandma died, I did not cry. At some stage, my parents realized that I had lost my Chinese. When they spoke Chinese to me, I replied in English. Only in my dreams, inside the cramped unit where I had spent the early years of my life, or on the concrete pavement near the iron gate of our compound, were the voices around me distinctly Chinese. Mm, amazing. So do, do you now feel fluent in, in English? I mean, clearly you sound very fluent in English. Do you, is, would you say you were? I think I'm, um, I probably have better access uh, to my Chinese. It's another uh, analogy is English is like a, a shop. I mean, a shop. I have to choose and pick 
um, and Chinese is like my home. I know what's in the wardrobe. So there's still there's still fundamentally an act of translation going on or a selection. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, you can. Please, no one. Um, I'm really interested because I think. Being bilingual is actually a big, a very difficult balancing act because language is very fluid. So when you're exposed to a certain language, that gets better, and then you start losing the other language that you know um, you formerly used. So um, to me, I think I really related to your reading because for me, I think language and culture is so interconnected. So for me, it was the opposite. I was very attached and very adamant that I wanted to keep my English because that was the only way that I could keep my you know, American aspect intact. And it's really interesting to me because um, I consider myself as bilingual, bicultural, but I kind of, I have a different character depending on the language. So, <laughs> so can, for you, can you give us your Japanese character? I'm very, oh, sorry. okay. So. <laughs> It's very interesting because um, I think I acquired that attitude as well as the language. So obviously I don't speak like this in Japanese. I'm very, you know, a little bit more passive and quiet. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so in Japanese I would be much more nervous and kind of, yeah. Minasan, konnichiwa. As opposed to this show pony yeah. steel seat. <laughs> yeah. Seat stealer that you yeah. are tonight. I'll be like, Minasan, konnichiwa. I saw the It's yeah. interesting, if I, can, if I may. Yeah. Um, English is my first language, and I still feel nervous speaking English. I think it comes down to the education thing. Um, but I also wanted to say that the, your reading moved me um, because my grandfather is Chinese. So I've tried to start learning Mandarin, and I didn't meet him till I was 21. So because you know sometimes people don't talk about their love affairs, and so you don't find out who your real family are until later. <laughs> but it's all about the love. Um, so I would love to know more about my Chinese language. Uh, the dialect is Hakka. Um, so hopefully one day. So I was inspired by your reading and touched by it too. So mm. I just wanted to say that, and hopefully I can get to know more about. What's in your wardrobe one day? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Kylie. In fact, um, the whole Asia Topa project has um, elicited quite a number of these stories. There's a fantastic exhibition on um, at ACME called Bombay Talkies, uh, which is a, um, a kind of a visual history and installation around a collection of uh, films from the 20s and 30s that were made in uh, Bombay uh, and which have been in an attic in Ivanhoe for many, many years. They are the only copies of these films in existence. So Melbourne is now the repository of the, the history of this particular uh, genre. Um, and the uh, young, uh, well, the, the, the rather middle-aged, but once young um, inheritor of these films had no idea that his grandfather was actually Indian. Um, Stephen, so it's a, it's can, a, can I add something about please. the translation of songs? I just want uh, uh, Kylie and uh, Nobko to know that in China, uh, songs were translated. Uh, song, songs are translated into Chinese and are sung in Chinese. So we would be singing Japanese songs in Chinese. Oh. So it's uh, in China, it's a very common practice. So I know many many uh, uh, European songs, but they're all in in Chinese. When I sing, <laughs> when I sing, I'm singing for Japanese songs. It's so karaoke rules. We, I was just going to yeah. say, you made me too. We should do karaoke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's a Japanese karaoke. <laughs> can, can we talk just for a second around... I'm really fascinated about the difference between character-based uh, uh, <clears throat> written language and phonetic-based written language. Um, as part of Asia Topa, there is an installation on the um, wall of Akka down near Malthouse Way uh, by a Chinese artist called Hei An. And what, um, what Hei An does is he uses social media and he says, I need the character for running water. And somebody goes and appropriates uh, a neon uh, character, which has that meaning, uh, usually from a, a building that's being demolished, but sometimes from a current kind of advertising sign. So all of these characters have different styles, they're different dimensions, they're incredibly beautiful. Some of them work, some of them don't. Um, and originally there were going to be something like 37 characters uh, on the outside of the building, 
but the engineering of achieving this was so expensive and so difficult that it had to be reduced to 27. But, of course, being characters as opposed to phonetic letters, it was possible to actually write the poem that Hayan had originally conceived because he just shuffled the characters around and, I mean, I'm sure there were, there were nuances of, of difference, but imagine if it had been uh, 27 letters instead of 34 for an English language work. It just wouldn't have worked. The whole work would have had to be reconceived. So I'm really interested in how this uh, impacts on the act of translation because it's such a different medium as opposed to the spoken word and the sung word. Japanese doesn't have to have a subject. So you don't need you or I. So often in sentences, you have to first figure out what the subject is, um, which is really interesting. Um, this might freaky. not have- It's just yeah. freaky. No, but I think it's very reflective of our culture because we, we don't <laughs> assert ourselves. So I, I don't have to say I, watashi wa, all the time. And I didn't figure this out until very recently. So my Japanese was kind of dictated by my English. So I would always write, I am doing, she is doing. And I'd read it and think, this is very awkward. Mm. Why, is, why are my sentences so awkward? And just only recently, I realized that I don't have to, you know, write the subject in Japanese. And I was like, <laughs> oh my god. Um, this, uh, I guess I'm kind of diverging a little bit, but one, one interesting thing that I wanted to mention, I don't know if it'd be interesting for you guys, but I think Jap Japanese is kind of a fickle language, I think, at the moment, because we um, import Western words. And I think that's kind of different for Chinese or your language. So a lot of the English words, we just use it as it is. I mean, we say thank you. Um, in Japanese, it's thank you. Um, what's another one? There's so many languages that we just import. We do have so many else. Yeah, we take it for granted, though, and I think I'm a little bit um, alarmed by that because we import certain Western words not knowing what they actually mean, and people just, yeah. um, you know, people just, <laughs> in, like, mm. put different meanings into that word, and it's kind of thrown around. So at the end, especially in the field of art, I feel, in theory, um, you know, you really don't know what anyone's talking about. <laughs> It can, it can make for some very it risque really, signage. Yeah, so everyone has sure. a different understanding of that particular word. And <laughs> I think that's a little bit dangerous. But I really respect, for example, Chinese. You know, you guys don't directly, you know, import words. You, you always, you know, you always have a translation, right? Seems like they've got a character for everything as well, yeah. I have to say. Just yeah. learning it. Yeah. So for, for Chinese, uh, indeed, we tend to we tend to translate, um, but there are uh, many words that are introduced um, from from foreign words. For example, the word philosophy is introduced through Japanese, so Joshi is is from Japanese. Really? Yeah, oh it gosh. is, um, and, and certainly there are words that are, are translated uh, uh, through the sound, uh, the transliteration, many words, and say. Uh, and some words, when I look at um, the English word, even when it's new to me, and I remember the Chinese translation, and it would be so spot on, like philharmonic, um, so that, that's a love of music. So in Chinese, that's introduced into Chinese as well, I agree. So I, I just want to say that because Chinese language is character-based, so it has a certain form. I feel that in translation, particularly if you're translating poetry, it's really important to keep the form. So Chinese, not oh. to mention the, the, the four character um, proverbs, which we're all very familiar with, and it has a lot of metaphor and it's very imagistic. Um, but also, in Chinese, we have these couplets, so two lines, um, and they are um, parallel. And uh, I give you an example. Say, uh, it's encouraging people to to study hard. It's 书山有路勤为径, 学海无涯苦作舟. The 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 words are matching. The characters are matching, and the sound there is a, a sonic effect as well. So in English, if I have to translate it, I need to maintain the um, that to make them parallel. So I will translate it into um, mountain of books has a path. Diligence is the way. Sea of knowledge has no boundary. Hardship is the vessel. Oh, wow. see. Oh. <laughs> just always feel, feel, feel as though, the, you know, the definitive thing's just being said. <laughs> um, can, can we just talk momentarily around um, Japanese, certainly, and I'm not sure about Chinese, has very uh, messy grammar, and it creates a lot of space. 
Um, and what it means, I was talking to a, a director, Toshiki Akara, who directed uh, Chelfish's production, Time Journey Through a Room, um, just a, a week or so ago. And he was saying that that messiness allows him to be very idiomatic. So his characters have a way of speaking which is an extreme ordinariness. Um, and it's the kind of extremity which, if it was translated into Australian Anglophile, would just be a grunt. Um, but, <laughs> but because the, the, the grammar allows this to be the case, it's still actually very powerful. Um, would you like to comment on that? I think I'm just going to say it from a, a purely translator's point of view, but Japanese grammar is very fluid. So you can change the or like the position of the subject doesn't even have to come at the beginning of the sentence. It can be the, you know, the verb could come first. So it's very flexible and um, you have to kind of do a lot of, you know, you have to think about the context and you have to really think about what the author thinks. So it's kind of like this process where you're making this very fluid sentence because I'm translating into English. You have to make, suddenly I have to make it very concrete, um, which is a challenge and it's, which, and it's um, actually really interesting as well. But that, yeah, so there in that process, I see such a different nature depending on the language, mm. yeah. Forgive me, I see that we're actually running short of time. We haven't had um, questions from the audience. Um, would anyone, so I'm not allowed to put my hand up to look at you. So there's a sea of nothingness, but bobbing <laughs> heads. But there are hands apparently, the microphone's making its way. Hi Hello. there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Um, thanks so much for your really interesting and generous discussion this evening. It's been wonderful to listen to you all. Um, I've got a question, whether or not you think that translation practitioners, this is about translation specifically because that's my um, background, um, do you think it's important for translation practitioners to be theorists as well, to have an understanding of translation studies and what's being written about the act of translation, to be good translators, or do you think that practitioners can be great translators without a knowledge or understanding of kind of what's being written around translation? I'm going to think about it. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond yeah, to that. Uh, yeah. and just to start with, um, I think uh, I haven't read very much about the translation theory. I feel that um, to be a practitioner is, you're, if you are a writer, do you have to be a critic at the same time? I, I, I don't, personally, I don't think so. And you can be a, a writer with, without having to be um, a teacher on how to write. Uh, and I feel that uh, this is um, translation is an art, in my view. And art practitioner is not necessarily art mm -hmm. critic and not necessarily art theorist. Well said. Well um, sorry, Carla. That's all right. Um, I would add to that, and I would, I would. For instance, if somebody was, if I didn't speak English and somebody was translating my stories in Yunga into English or any other language for that matter. I would want them to encapsulate the essence of the story I'm telling, not just the words that I'm speaking. So I don't know so much about learning to translate in a specific style or um, in theory per se, but I think the essence always should, should be there. And, and you mentioned art as well. I think each translator probably would not translate the same style, which makes the translation unique hence art as well, but I, I would strongly recommend that the essence be strong and honourable to, to the specifics of what the story is as well. There was a review of uh, a new translation of the I Ching in The Australian on the weekend, and Barry Hill, great poet, wrote the review, and he concluded it by saying that this particular translation, I think the author is David Hinton, had washed the pedagogy away and what a relief it was. And that clearly that was a poet reviewing another poet's work. Um, but it would suggest to me that he, for one, uh, would rather the, the, um, the intellectualising of the process be absent from the experience of reading the, the work. Do we have another question? Yes, you've spoken about uh, song and uh, written translation. I'd just like to hear something on oral translation in, a, in a, you know, a moving environment. 
Carly? I suppose it's going to go to me, yeah. seeing as I come from a strong oral history mob. Um, it was interesting listening to these guys talk about characters um, and translating from that. I was sitting here thinking about our oral traditions and how stories are passed on, and we were having a chat in the green room, green room I can't even say green room, uh, <laughs> earlier, <laughs> green room in that place there, um, about... Come, coming back to the expression of telling a story as well, orally, it's about um, being with a person and pointing to the particular thing they're speaking about or walking together in that particular space um, or exchanging the tears or the laughter. Um, so definitely it comes back to that ess essence of making sure that what you're a part of or what you're experiencing um, is as accurate and authentic, truly, to what is being exchanged. I don't know how else to elaborate on that, but, but, but there's a very um, strong component within our culture, obviously, of the oral storytelling um, and language. Also, the hearing it, you know, you can learn a language in written form, but it's not going to be the same. A lot of our language that is documented is documented in, in uh, Roman script, so the sounds aren't accurate. So a lot of people are talking Australian blackfella, um, which is okay. They still know the words. But, you know, some people say nunga, some say nyunga, some say nyungar. Um, the sounds are a bit different, but the English characters or the Roman script characters are, you know. I, I don't know if I've answered that enough for you, but I'm good at having a yarn. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Thank you. Question. Do you guys um, want to add to that at all? Sorry. No? Okay. <laughs> She's shaking her head. Hello, uh, panellists. Um, I've here got a question specifically goes to Isabel Lee. And I would like to ask, um, how much do you think writing in different languages um, is an act um, for you to, I guess, to choose your identity in a way? Um, for example, if you have a particular story in mind, what would make you make the decision to write this story in English or in Chinese? Is that moon depending or it's, it's or <laughs> just a matter of style? That's or a great question. Uh, well, I must say that um, cause living in an English-speaking country, I um, write uh, in, in English. It's always a difficult decision to, to make. Uh, I don't know whether people have heard of a Chinese-American uh, Chinese writer, Ha Jin, mm. um, and he has written a, a, a small book called Writer as Migrant. And um, the second chapter is about um, the choosing language, and he particularly gave the example of Nabokov and Conrad. So Conrad, um, you know, wrote in, in English and abandoned his Polish, and he was actually um, a lot of people weren't happy with with that. It, it's seen as a betrayal, and so was Nabokov, and he was saying. It was a very painful experience to to having to in a way not to write in Russian, but it's also a pragmatic choice. Um, but, but what I want to say is, to me, language are not mutually exclusive. They are a world vocabulary. So having another language is a really um, pardon me to say that it's it's an advantage, and I often introduce Chinese expressions into English. Some of my uh, titles of my uh, stories are actually phrases in Chinese. Say a fishbone in the throat is you know the inability to speak. That's the title of one of the stories. Another one is as green as blue, and that's from from a poet, uh, from a poem. Uh, it's 日出江花红胜火，春来江水绿如蓝，能不忆江南. So in English, it's um, at sunrise the river flowers are as as red as fire. In spring, the the river, uh, the river water is as green as blue. How can I not miss the South Bank? <laughs> so it's a very nostalgic uh, mm. poem, and I use that as a title. Beautiful, thank you. Nabokov, were you writing? Oh, sorry, I dropped my mm -hmm. pen again. Were you writing something down to comment, or oh, no, just speaking. for reflections <laughs> later? <laughs> Lovely. Another question. Um, you mentioned the importance of capturing the essence of the original author. Um, is there an advantage um, or would you prefer to have access to the author or does that create more pressure and you'd prefer to just have it handed over completely for you, you to interpret the essence? 
Great question. You went, oh, I don't know, I'll let your vocal go first. Um, I'd like to hear Isabel's input on this as well, but um, I do a lot of practical translation, not necessarily literary translation, and um, I often work with artists um, in the field of contemporary art, and when I translate texts, for example, artist statements for the, these artists, um, a lot of the time I need <laughs> to reorganize the information so that it's understandable to an English audience. Um, I think it depends on the context, it depends on what you're translating, but I personally really like to work with the artist and list, um, you know, just listen to, ask them what they want to convey and make it, it's almost an editing process as well, but I just, you know, I almost edit it so that it can be communicated and understood by an English audience. And I think that editing process is also kind of essential when you're translating something, especially cultural translation. Is it difficult to persuade the artist that you've done that to their uh, accuracy? Um, not very much. Um, so in ja in Japan, I feel people are very they they're almost like allerg um, they have allergies toward English, <laughs> and I don't know where this comes from. But we go through. Um, so I guess English is taught from junior high school all the way to That's university. Yeah. But for some reason, no one speaks English in Japan. I think people that you know. They're too shy, they're too scared of making mistakes. And obviously, there is, isn't is really much of a chance to speak English in Japan because, um, I dare to say this, but we're pretty homogenous. I want to say we don't have that much diversity. So um, <laughs> um, it's kind of, you know, we have this very weird relationship with English. So when I get a translation job, they're like, oh, okay, so you can translate that for me because, sorry, I don't know any English. So they really almost don't want to touch it. And so I really kind of encourage the artist to kind of, you know, work with me so that I, you know, because it's, you know, statements are really important and the way you edit and frame an information is very, you know, it's almost in integral to the presentation of the work, so. That's like a collaboration. Yeah, yeah so I, I like a, I like a collab, I take a, yeah. I like to take a collaborative approach in terms of translation, in my context at least. Uh, just quickly, Essence, it's always wonderful if you can uh, spend time with the author or the person or whoever you're translating for. I just want to share a moment uh, at Chogham in Perth. One of our senior language custodians and senior people in our community was on live television and was supposed to say um, something in language to address the Queen. And she was a little bit stumped. And I was on stage with her at the time because I just helped sing the wonderful song that represents our country. Um, and and uh, she was stumped for words. And in the rehearsal, they kept telling her in English what she needed to say. But she needed to say it in, in Nyunga, Nyunga yeah. language. And I was watching this and I was observing that and took a deep breath and I just leant down in her ear and spoke to her in Nyunga language. Straight away she knew what she was supposed to say. And it's because I was observant of her and, and could almost, in a way, see her mind ticking um, that it helped me to, to help her find her essence. When I'm translating directly f from Shakespeare, it's so well documented and so well spoken about and, and there's so much to, to draw on to capture that essence. If, the, if it wasn't heavily documented, I would want to know the person so that I can get, try and get their personality and, or what they're speaking about. Um, Shakespeare was great for us. We chose certain ones just quickly that had a lot of nature involved in, in the metaphoric stuff he was speaking about. So that made it a lot easier to capture the essence. I remember when I read Bill Gummidge's book, he was talking to an elder and Bill was referring to the fact that there were rabbits. Uh, and he said to the elder, <clears throat> um, well, the rabbits weren't always here. And the elder said, yes, they were. We just hadn't seen them yet. <laughs> so the fact that there hadn't been a word for it, that's irrelevant. And that's the other thing too, is that a lot of our mob have speak very few words, but that doesn't mean they don't have a lot to say. Ooh, beautiful. Yeah. That's a great way to end, actually. If you, if, uh, Isabel, is there something you're burning to say? Uh, yeah, I, I want to add, because um, um, I translated a Mark Trudinick, an Australian poet, so I did uh, work quite closely with him. So... Um, 
I found that um, um, a very good way to get to know the author's frame of mind is to read what he was reading when he was oh, writing. Oh, great idea. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's fantastic a advice. Very powerful. It's like a, a looking over his mm. shoulder kind of thing. <laughs> I also want to say that um, uh, I think, Stephen, you asked uh, whether the artist is willing to participate. So in this case, I would say that it's not only an important experience for the translator, it's for the author as well. And translation should be a process, a, a journey. And uh, after that, you know, nothing is the same as before. No, no. Um, uh, thank you very much. The, the lights are flashing, so we do have to conclude. But I just want to end with a quote, because we all agreed um, on something backstage, and I think I found the quote to articulate it. Uh, Woe to the makers of literal translations, who by rendering every word weaken the meaning. It is indeed by doing so that we can say the letter kills and the spirit gave life, gives life. That was Voltaire. I mean, in response to that, rather extreme, but it's a beautiful um, notion, Book 47 of the I Ching, when there's talk, there's no sincerity, no accuracy. Revere words and you soon wither, impoverished away. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>